Welcome to Grid Talk and happy Pride Month. My name is George Harrison and today we are here to preview the 2024 Canadian Grand Prix. Joining me today we have a Grid Talk co-host Sophia Richmond. Hi. F1 historian Alex Booth. Hello. And Formula One enthusiast Mikhail Kataya. Hello. Hey everyone. So, but before we get into the episode, we must thank our sponsor for this episode, Bet Online. Bet Online is your number one source for the NBA Finals and Stanley Cup playoffs this season. Every start, every matchup, and even live odds and spreads while the games are being played. When the game's over, head over to our online casino and get in on a game of blackjack or poker, or unwind with one of our over 150 slot games. Head over to the website today to get in on the action. Use the promo code BELIEVE, that's B L E A V. A 50% welcome bonus on your first deposit. Bet online, where the game starts. So, oh, unsurprisingly, where we're going to start, Alex, is uh, with Esteban Ocon. As we're recording this earlier today, on the 3rd of June, the uh, the news has broke that it's confirmed that uh, sorry, Esteban Ocon will not be retained by Alpine for next year. He's been dropped. Has this come as a surprise to you, and is it the right decision for Alpine? It has occurred as a major surprise, considering the Ferrari over the Monaco collision between Ocon and Gasly, because I think there are even rumours that he was going to be dropped with immediate effect. So no, it doesn't come as a surprise. The, the fact that they've announced it prior to the summer break, it one way is a good thing for Ocon, because it's a lot of time to get a contract sorted. But on the other hand, it's a little surprise from Alpine that if that, if that was going to be the intention all the way through, that it's a surprise that they've announced it that quickly in that respect. So one could argue that it's definitely to do with what happened at Monaco. So for the harmony of the team, it's probably the right decision. It was a very political move to have two Frenchmen in, in an all-French team, even though it's based in England. And, and it hasn't really, and it's not really worked because they collided in Melbourne last year. Ocon's got a history of colliding with his teammates. He seems like a lovely guy, but he's not a lovely guy on the track, uh, which is as a lot of other drivers on the test too. So yeah, but it's got, it's got enough time to secure um, a seat for next year. And I think he probably knows a lot more than he's letting on. Most likely, yeah, most likely. I mean, I, I saw on, on YouTube the other day, Sky Sports F1 put a compilation of uh, Ocon's uh, collisions with his teammates, which I thought was very apt, but I also think it was quite bad for Ocon, the fact that you could make a decent compilation of that shows you how many there's been. But yeah, definitely things going on behind the scenes. An interesting move from from Alpine to do this so quickly after the Monaco Grand Prix, Mikhail. Has, uh, same question to you, really. Has this come as a surprise, and, and who do you think is most likely to take over from Ocon next year? Well, like Alex was saying, is that is it a real surprise that he's dropped this at the end after this season? No, not necessarily. When Gasly joined the team, I didn't think that they would keep both of them for for too long. Even though, again, all French team, I guess. I find it odd that the timing has come after Monaco because I certainly believe that a, a lot of the decisions were already made beforehand. And then now that it's published like this, it. Ma- stirs up even more rumors of like oh maybe this was the final straw or something but in terms of who's going to replace him my my biggest assumption would be the Alpine reserve driver or junior reserve driver Jack Dewan just because I think he's been built very well in the pipeline and he's the primary junior candidate that that Alpine has I know there's Victor Martins for example in the F2 but he's been having a horrendous season so his chances are not really increased by that so I'm assuming it'll be Jack Dewan. I do think maybe I just find this timing weird again. So maybe there are some speculative contract news that might come. And that would suggest that maybe I'll be in a signed with an existing driver and they want to publish it. But if that's not the case, I'll, I'll definitely assume it's going to be Dewan. Yeah, it's, it's interesting timing, like you say. I mean, I, I think Alpine have come out and said that the incident in Monaco has not had a bearing on their decision, which I find absolutely unbelievable. I don't know how it can have no bearing. Even if it's the case that they were looking to replace Ocon here, which might be the case, I do find it hard to believe, to be honest. I think they probably would have wanted to keep, like you said, two French drivers in a French team. As long as they're, you know, getting on all right, they'd want to keep that going. But unsurprisingly, old wounds have reopened with these two because we know they didn't get on from back in the karting days. People who have watched Drive to Survive know that as well. They've explained the difference of opinion and what happens. So it wasn't a surprise that something like this happened, but... But yeah, it's for my money, I think it's probably going to be Jack Dewan as well that comes into that team. And Sophia, I think you agree with that as well. You were nodding along to what Mikhail was saying. I mean, you're, you're someone who covers Formula 2 quite a bit for our sister show. I mean, how talented is Jack Dewan and is he ready for F1? 100%. I mean, he is testing in a 2022 car shortly as well. But I mean, there is two Alpine junior drivers in Formula 2, Kushmini as well, who has also been probably more consistent over Victor Martins last season and this season as well. I think Kushmani got points every single round except for like maybe two or three races last season. So he is very much a good consistent driver 
for the Alpine team, but 100%, it, it would be Dead Jack and I think would take the seat. But going back as well, Alcon got a podium last year in Monaco. He's been a race winner as well for Alpine. So compared to, obviously, Gasly has won as well. If you look at kind of the stats, they aren't very, very, very much equal. But obviously, Alcon's had a few calls and misjudgments. And I think definitely Monaco put a nail in the coffin. But Definitely there was talks before. I've seen rumors that he might even take a small contract to Mercedes um, because obviously he has had that connections with Mercedes over the years, as you could probably see when watching Drive to Survive. So who knows? I don't think he will get a seat in 2025, but maybe just do a short stint for Mercedes to help them for the new development. But definitely Jack Dewan will be in the seat, hopefully, for next season. Yeah, I hope so too. It's always good seeing F2 drivers make it to F1 because unfortunately that's getting increasingly rare. At least it seems that way anyway. So might have taken him a little longer than what he would have hoped. But yeah, if he's in the car permanently for the next year, I don't think Jack will be complaining at that. But let us know, guys. What Let us know. This is a breaking news story. It's only happened uh, literally early today as we record this. So, you know, po- post to us on our on our social medias, at Grid Talk UK, everywhere you can find the at symbol to, to let us know about that. But yeah, so let's actually talk about the race that's coming up. Canada. So, Alex, you're the F1 historian. Can you uh, can you take us a, give us a trip down memory lane to some of the classic Canada moments? Because it's a track that's, well, it's a race that's been on the calendar for 50-odd years, and it's been at the Circuit Gilles Villeneuve for 45 or so, since 78, I think. So it's a track that's got a lot of history over the years. Well, yeah, it's one of my favourite circuits, and it's one that I always look forward to. Canada's provided some with provided us with some classic races in the past, in certainly the memorable uh, 2011 race, which is the longest race in history due to the stoppage with Jensen Buttons ending up last and then coming to win. If you go back further than that, 2007, Lewis Hamilton's first win. 2001, the Schumacher Brothers battle, and even further back, 98, which is a crazy race. There's so many incredible races that are there, and um, it, it's, it still continues to provide some interesting racing, and I hope we get this, more of the same on Sunday. Yeah, absolutely. Mikhail, what are your main memories of, of Canada? What One does jump out to me from a Finnish perspective, not a particularly good one, Kimi Raikkonen getting hit by Lewis Hamilton in 2008. I was feeling that pain as well that day. But have you got any better memories of Canada through the years? I, I mean, from a Finnish perspective, I don't, I don't remember anything anything particularly positive. I do remember the Daniel Ricciardo's win. I think that's still one of the more, I mean, I guess it's not recent anymore at this point, but it's still like one of the I guess more modern memories I have, especially since it wasn't a, it was still a Mercedes dominated season, but he was sort of one of the sparkles. I kind of remember the year it was, to be honest. I would have to look that up. 14. 26. Yeah, 14. Yeah, that's, yeah, that's quite, that's probably my, honestly, the memory that jumps out the most. Cause I've felt that the last few Canadian races just have been somewhat more boring, which is sad because it is a track layout that I like, especially on like, <laughs> especially doing it myself virtually. Yeah, me too, me too. It's, it's one of my favourites to drive in the F1 game. I'm sure it's got nothing to do with the amount of corner cutting you can get away with. But anyway, let's move on from that. But yeah, Sophia, what, what are your main memories of Canada? Like Mikhail kind of alluded to there, a lot of a lot of the classic moments in Canada are actually quite a while ago. I, I don't really have many standout memories from the past few years, but can this year change that? I mean, definitely. There has been changes, obviously, to the track as well. You have that new grass patch as well, but... Canada's always been quite interesting because they can see how powerful the DRS is. There's really good opportunities to overtake. I mean, last year we saw Max Verstappen get Red Bull's 100th, 100th victory. Alex Albon had his highest scoring position as P7, which he also tied in Monza, I believe. Lance Stroll, as well, every year besides 2018, has scored points. So hopefully that record keeps on going as well. But I mean... Those are kind of my standouts from like a numbers perspective because y'all know I like my numbers and statistics. But overall, it's just a really good race just to watch in general. So many good overtakes. I was watching the highlights from last season. There were some really good opportunities in some of the corners as well. And especially because it's shaping up to be not a Red Bull dominated uh, season so far. We've had, what, three different winners so far. It definitely will show who has the stronger car, I think, when we go to Montreal this weekend. Yeah, you rightfully alluded to it there, the fact that, you know, we've had three different teams and then four different drivers win so far this year, which is about an average of one every other race, which when you think about it, especially with how downtrodden a lot of people after the first couple of races, is not bad at all. But Alex, we've, we've had a couple of surprise winners in, in Lando Norris and Charles Leclerc at, at Monaco as well. Is this potentially a bit of a turning point of the season for Red Bull? Because they obviously seemed miles off in Monaco. Christian Horner was saying it was largely down to the track. 
but it was still a big performance gap at the end of the day. Is this a vital race for Red Bull? Is it one that they f- you feel that they really have to win to stamp their authority on things? I think if they don't win this weekend, then I think maybe the tide is starting to turn a little bit. I think if if Red Bull go this, if if Max Verstappen completely wipes the floor with everybody this weekend, then maybe we were probably getting a bit too excited too soon. And that's no disrespect to him, but obviously they know they deserve all the success they've got. But if if they don't, and it's another you know, winner that we didn't really predict right from the word go. I won't I would, I would say exciting race because the, the last couple of races haven't been brilliant. I don't, I don't you think. But if if it's a, if it's an unexpected result, then we are in for potentially a championship fight, and maybe then it's not, it's not such a, a Red Bull walkover. But I I, I, do, I think there's a slight possibility that normal service could be resumed. Fair enough, uh, Mikhail. What do you think? Is it going to be more of a normal service with it being more of a a normal track in Canada, or or are we likely to see another upset with the likes of McLaren or maybe Ferrari stepping up to to win the race? I don't know. I'm just I'm I guess eternally pessimistic. I'm assuming Max to kind of come back and and like you said, stamp his authority over it. But at the same time, I did actually just pull it up, and if I'm not wrong, wasn't Fernando Alonso on second place last last year actually? So. It's not. It's it's possible that we could have some sort of a surprise at least. Although obviously Aston Martin was much better last year than than this year. So maybe. I mean, I'm hoping that Charles is able to keep his, uh, his streak going, but I'm I'm expecting it to be Max's stomping ground again. Sophia, what are you thinking? Are you thinking it's going to be three in a row for Verstappen in Canada this weekend? Oh, maybe. But I was just doing a quick check as well. It's also going to see how qualifying is because just quickly glancing over the last five times we race in Canada, the top three has pretty much stayed the top three as well. So if Red Bull does not have a good qualifying, which obviously we saw in Monaco, I think that also opens the door for other drivers to come in. But even if Max wins, he'll still lead the championship. It's a 31 points gap between him and Charles right now. So obviously if Max comes in second and Charles comes in first, like obviously the gap is still wide, but it still will get kind of close now how many rounds in. But I think all eyes will be on qualifying. Like I said, the last five years the top three pretty much have remained the top three or maybe even the top four so also as well it's meant to be raining this whole weekend as well so that's also going to be a quite an interesting one to see because some of these cars do not do well in the wet performance so it's going to be cold it's actually the coldest day the whole week on sunday race day as well so that's also another factor that we've kind of not really seen over the recent years as well so it should be a good uh, race weekend for sure yeah you beat me too there with our forecast i just looked it up as well and it it looks very, very British. It looks very, very uh, dull and uh, and rainy. Cold by F1 standards, I should preface that, because, uh, yeah, twenty mid-20s and low-20s is actually quite warm over here in this part of the world, but by F1 standards, that is quite cold. And, yeah, as we've seen in races like, like Alex alluded to before, like 2011, it can, it can absolutely throw many, many spanners in the works, and... We'll have to see what happens with that. But then again, if anybody, if anybody's good in the wet on the grid, it's the likes of Max Verstappen and uh, Sir Lewis. They're the two that kind of jump out to me. But Alonso's great qualifying last year is definitely a reason for optimism. Although I, I'm with you on that, Mon Mikhail. I, I don't see it really happening again this year without Master Martin, out, unfortunately. But yeah, so I, w- I wanted to talk about about the rules in in F1, and this is a bit of a this is a bit of a, this is a callback to Monaco, and also kind of a looking forward to potentially. Potentially a race maybe like Singapore later in the season. I don't think we're likely to see the exact scenario of what happened in Monaco again. But we had, obviously in Monaco, we had a lot of guys hitting, or change their tyres I should say, during the red flags. And that allowed the majority of the field, from what I could see, especially the front runners, to do essentially the entire race on one set of tyres, bar one lap. Alex, this is, I mean, this is a circuit where we've seen a lot of red flags over the years and safety car restarts and everything. Is it potentially a time for F1 to have a look at maybe changing that rule? Because, see, unfortunately, I, I think it really affected the Monaco race in a negative way. Well, it certainly did. Yeah, there's absolutely no denying that. I mean, you know, I, I love the Monaco Grand Prix. I always have and always will. I've stood up against it time to go. And I certainly don't think it is. I think it certainly deserves its place on the calendar. But I do agree that the tyre rule really played a part. And I think that's, I think it's, preposterous to be honest you know we had drivers going at pace which was pretty much on par with f2 that should never happen in formula one there's no excuse for it and yeah i think that needs to be addressed immediately and something should be done about it and, and i also think even looking forward i think putting it putting in a mandatory second pit stop or something like that because trying to do the whole race on one set of tires just is uh, i know i don't particularly like it when everything when things are put in purely for entertainment because i understand it can get a bit gimmicky but you have to draw the line somewhere and just in this constant tire management, 
it is just not entertaining. It's just not you know fun to watch at all. It's just it's just taxi driving. You know, there's it, it should, something needs to be done about it. I think just just to improve it. Yeah, I think there needs to be a change of that. To be fair, like, like you said, going the the pace was just uh, yeah. It was it was not good between the, between the front front four or so, especially towards the end. Yeah, not not very entertaining. But Mikhail, is this something that you think that needs to change as well? Is it is a mandatory second stop in, just for Monaco, for example? Is that something that kind of needs to happen to allow the race to move with the times, for lack of a better term? Yeah, I mean, I, I yeah, I don't know about the second mandatory piece, but I mean, there is obviously there is precedent just for FIA to make special rules for Monaco, just not for F1, but I mean, F2 qualifying is split between two groups for the you know, sake of there not being too much traffic and blocking. So, of course, there's always room to make it special. And I think if they are to address anything with rule changes, I would prefer if it was more done, tailored with, let's just keep it in Monaco. I mean, I know you mentioned Singapore, and to be fair, there are legitimate arguments to also make some changes with Singapore, but I think we, especially with Monaco, with the lack of, with even worse opportunities to overtake than in Singapore, I just feel like it would make sense if we are doing something, then then let's do it for Monaco first. Because I'm thinking, because the, the r- specific rule with like changing tariffs during the, the red flag, it's been controversial once before I remember in Monza some years back where we had a red flag and then you had some cars that were just, again, drivers waiting and hoping for a safety car pit stop and then they get an even better luck because they get a red flag pit stop where you don't lose any positions or any time and to be honest i was even surprised with with monaco because i thought that the rule with the tires is that you have to drive one full lap with your tire compound before it counts but it's just the fact that you're using it you can already pit basically so i i, I don't know maybe you could look into that because i mean f2 has the same the rule of like not pitting under a virtual safety car Although it did end up still deciding something last week, last weekend, but yeah, the, I am in favor of it. But I would rather just do it for Monaco because I guess for Monaco, you know, you could allow a bit more gimmicky things than than for the whole season. I guess. What do you think, Sophia? Do you think we should uh, think we should have a special rule for F one in Monaco? Mikhail rightfully referenced there that qualifying for F two and I think F three as well is is different. It's completely unique because it's a completely unique circuit. And it is a unique circuit because it's the only one that doesn't run to the full Grand Prix distance, for example. And, you know, if you were to suggest Monaco, it's been said lots, but if you were to suggest Monaco as a new race this year, it'd never get, it'd never pass. It's only on the calendar because it's Monaco. Rightfully so. I'm with Alex on that one. It is rightfully there. It deserves its place. But the amount of complaints that are coming in from the fans, it's it's a bit concerning, especially when Liberty have said, I don't want to say this openly, but they have reportedly says that they don't need Monaco. If they want to get rid of it, they will do. Which I don't agree because that is Triple Crown. There is drivers who still want to do Triple Crowns. It is one of the most iconic races. However, like with the pitch strategy, for, there's no way to really overtake, especially with how big these cars are now, these F1 cars in Monaco. It's not built for it. So it comes down to the pitch strategy. I agree with maybe not getting the tire change under red flag, but under safety car, I kind of agree because like Mikhail said, we've seen a few times where drivers will pit under safety, not thinking you'll go to a red and then they've lost so many positions and then the drivers will have the free opportunity to change it in the red. I remember, I think it was like Lando Norris that had a really big kickoff about that because he literally just pitted right when it turned to red and he lost so many spots in that race. So I 100% agree. I mean, even like it, it, it is difficult to say and obviously... It depends on what circuits are one-stop strategies. If it is a circuit that might have two to three stops, I can be kind of more lenient. But again, it's if we want to do something specific for Monaco, like we, we do for F2 and F3 with qualifying, that makes more sense. But then we have to look at, is there any other tracks that also can be a one-stop strategy? Also, as well with the tires, I mean, it, it can go even to IndyCar rules, potentially, which is they have to do one lap in order to switch off to counter for the regulation so doing the hard tire for one lap and then moving to the soft and then again you also have to think about degradation you have to think about how the track is as well and how the rubbering especially again monaco is a street circuit it is open during race weekend people are driving around like right after the races so that also has another big factor to it but i agree not allowing change of tires to be allowed during red fly i do agree with safety cars especially if it is a more than one pit stop race yeah i think i think safety cars fair enough and yeah it, it is a bit strange how you know the f1 guys don't even have to do a lap some of them didn't even do a sector and specifically 
you know, referencing that, Alex, I was, when I was watching the race, because I watched the race live, when I was watching it live, I was very confused as to why or what was going on in terms of, like, Carlos Sainz being allowed to restart from his old grid position. And to my understanding, and again, this is really complicated, which is the part of the problem, uh, to my understanding, the whole reason why he was allowed to do that was because Zhou Guan Yu got caught up in that three-car pileup at the back of the field and wasn't able to finish the first sector. So because of that, the grid was allowed to reset. If Joe passed through the first sector line, which he would have done, I think, five seconds or so after he actually did, it was very close, then Carlos Sainz wouldn't have allowed to restart, and it would have had to be a, a rolling safety car start, I think. So the, the point is is that these restart rules are really complicated. I, I, th I think these this is something else that potentially needs to get looked at, because... Again, this is kind of is likely to be a race where we're going to get quite a few of those. Well, this is why I didn't want you to call me the F1 expert anymore because I'm not sure how that now. I can I can give you a fact that if we go all the way back to 1995 at Monza, David Coulthard spun out on the formation lap. Now, that would have automatically made him out of the race as a, a good starter. But there was an accident on the first lap and the race was stopped and restarted. And because it was declared null and void, he was allowed to start for his pole position again. So rule, rules have been there you know, for a you know, the rules in that respect have been around for, for a long time. I wasn't aware of the science, the science being able to start in third again because of the, the incident with Joe Grand You have to forgive me, I didn't actually watch the race, so I'm just trying my best to. But so I would have assumed that he could have been able to start in third anyway. That, that's, that's my understanding. I apologize if it's not cutting edge, but uh, and that, that, yeah, that was my understanding. One thing I, would, I did want to add though, um, with regards to the last question, and Sophia alluded to this. I think uh, with all the criticism of, uh, criticism of Monaco, I think the size of the cars and the, the titles needs to be addressed first before we discuss Monaco. And that's the main thing. Because they're, they're just ridiculously big. And not just for Monaco, for anywhere. They are. They are, yes. Yeah. And, and to their credit, the FIA are actually looking at this. It's being discussed in the Concord Agreement. They're going to make the cars have a shorter wheelbase and be, I think, 10 centimetres narrower as well, which which will help. Which will help. But yeah, they are... The size of, I can't remember, saying, I think it was, um, it was either a Wayne or, or Tom on the on the Monaco review, but they are, in terms of the profile of the floor, the size of a Maybach, it's just That's the only crazy. thing, it, it is, the only thing that sets them apart is the fact that they're so low, that their actual profile, their actual space that they're taking up, like, you won't be able to fit it in a, in a regular car parking spot here in the UK, and that's a, that's a cutting edge Formula 1 car, so it, it seems very, very odd for sure. I mean, I was all for making the cars bigger and more aggressive and faster and everything in 2017, but now I look what it's done and I think, did we really need to do this? But yeah, so, Mikhail, I'm going to I'm gonna ask a similar question to you. I apologise if, if it's a difficult one to answer, but it's something I'm going further back. If we go to Australia last year, I think Karun Chandot was furiously going through the rule book to figure out what was going to happen at the third red flag restart. And he couldn't figure it out. And he had literally had the rule book in front of him. So again, do, do things kind of need to be simplified for the for the fans to understand? Because like we've all, we've all watched F1 for years. And the fact that we can't immediately go, oh yeah, this is going to be a safety car restart. Oh, he's going to reset. It's going to still go on the grid. The fact that we can't do that, it's just going to turn people off who aren't as familiar with the sport. That is true. Although I will say with the, with the specific case of Australia, I don't think we can write the rule book to be so specific as to what happened in Australia to actually dictate in all of those situations. But what happened in Monaco should be expected to happen in Monaco, so there should be quite a clear quite a clear way to make the decision on it. I do think, specifically with what happened in, in Monaco, I don't necessarily hate how it ended up being dealt with, because when it comes to like a first lap crash or in general or something like this, one of the issues that came to mind, at least to me, when I was listening to, to Alex also talk, is the fact that, for example with the decision of, of how we did now because Zhou wouldn't couldn't pass the first sector mark. That's also down to just the humans at the <laughs> in the FIA sort of deciding when to put the red flag. So if we had a rule, let's say, that decides that specifically on the moment where the red flag is flown, that is the new order for a new restart, for example. Well yeah, but then that's down to when do you press the button? Because someone might be doing like just throwing a lunge and then just be a few centimeters ahead at the right moment. We're, and then we, we have this kind of a rule where you can sort of reset the grid to the best of your ability because so not everyone who's still in the race was able to finish the first sector. At least that kind of removes a bit of the, the, the human side of things. So if we wanted to make it completely, you know, how would you say this, like completely, I guess, fair and without like that sort of human error to it, I guess we should make the rule that if there is a crash 
and then red flag is flown at any point because of that crash, you restart the order, whether it's a rolling start or standing, that's a different thing, but you make the order be what it was at the exact moment of the crash. But then it's of course come to the question of like, where do you draw the <laughs> rare specific, which millisecond did the crash happen? But I think that would be something that you could make as a change to clarify things. It would still confuse everyone, but I've, that's kind of how red flags are always. It's just, it, there's so much stuff that happens, but that it just confuses people anyway in the moment. But I guess that would be something to kind of clear it out at least. Well, your philosophy, is this the nature of the beast or is it just, or is it something that we could actually help? I think it's just Monica. That's the thing as well. Like it, it is red flags are thrown so quickly and more often in Monica than any as well, just because of the nature of the track. Again, it is narrow. There's no time to kind of change. If you go off, there is no off track. You hit the wall and that's it. So obviously it is a bit difficult to say. I mean, with the red flag call, like, I, I don't agree that Carlos should have started P3, especially again, and I'm going to keep on saying it, it is Monaco. The top 10 for the first time ever finished how they qualified. Like, it is not an opportunity to overtake track. Had it been another track where overtaking is allowed, okay, I wouldn't say that's fine. Carlos still says P3, but it's a track where how you start qualifying is how you're going to finish. That, and especially because a lot of these drivers had opportunities to overtake. I think Yuki moved up a few places, like a few of the drivers moved up a few places before the red flag was shown, and then it was all for nothing as well. Obviously, Ocon and Gauss's situation as well, even though moving up places and subsequently causing damage, they there was a lot of drivers that were able to make some headway at the start, which is something you don't see again in Monaco. So to do all that and then go back to how it was, it made it really boring. But again, how will you know as well? Throw in many sectors, but even again, it's a short track and just timing. And then obviously, like Mikhail says, when does the fly get flown as well? Like, is it straight away? Is it maybe a couple seconds later? What What's the process? And the thing is with rules as well, having worked in other sports as well, it's very difficult to create rules that also can be blanketed, but also in specific situations. Like, obviously, you mentioned Australia as well. Like, it is, there's no kind of historical record that you can base it off of. So you're never going to get a definite answer. You're never going to actually be like, this is the perfect situation according to the rules because there has been no other opportunity that this has happened for. So you're not going to please everybody, especially when it comes to the FIA and how they like to rule. But I, it, it's chaotic. But again, I don't think we would ever see this happen in another race to an extent like what we did last weekend, two weekends ago in Monaco. Yeah, it's it's an interesting one for sure. It's de it's definitely it's definitely tough for the rule makers. There's, there's a reason why that rule book is so long because it has to cover so many different scenarios and all this to that and the other stuff. So it, it's not easy. It's not easy for sure. But I I really enjoyed the discussion on that. And if you and if you dear listen, if you've enjoyed it as well, you can head over to Spotify or Apple Podcasts and give us a five star review on those. I really do appreciate it. And if you're one of the 72% of the people that are not subscribed to our YouTube channel, please consider helping us out with a like and subscribe on those. We normally go out live after the races themselves. This is a pre-recorded show, but you can join us on the live chat as well on the YouTube channel when we are reviewing the Canadian Grand Prix in a few days' time. So, with all that, all that, all that covered, let's get into some predictions. So, Alex, I want to hear who's your pole prediction, your podium prediction, and a ball prediction as well, please. See, my bold predictions and the and the current and the actual predictions tend to be the same, but I'll I'll, I'll do my best. For Paul, I'm going to go Leclerc because he's a very good qualifier. But we all know that. And the Ferrari is getting and the Ferrari has been quick, so I'll go for I'll go for Leclerc. Paul, he'll pit Verstappen and David Norris the head. We'll say Verstappen, Leclerc, Perez podium. And a bold prediction. Well, I've just worked out in my head. I can think of five drivers who've taken their first victory at Count in Canada. Oscar Piastri will make that number six. Hey, my man. That's, that's what that's what mine was going to be as well. I, I would love to see Piastri get a, get a win. It's been coming, to be fair. He's shown some incredible pace, for sure. So, Mikhail, what's your top three poll and the bold prediction, please? Well, I think the, the forecast is going to make it, I guess, a bit more interesting. The, the poll, I'm just going to give it to Max, because I still... Even with rain, I would never bet against him. So I'm just going to say Max on pole. But then for the podium, well, Max is not going to be that exciting of a guess. But I would go for, yeah, I'm, I'm going to say Max, Lando, and Sir Lewis Hamilton in that order. Which would be nice for the British, all of the British viewers and listeners of the show. And then, yeah, I mean, my wild, you know, wild. I'm going to guess, I'm going to say Aston Martin in double points, you know. 
has been a bad season, but I'm going to say it's again Lance like Sophia already alluded. Strong at home, relatively strong at least, and then I think Alonso will be back, especially with the rain, so I'm going to go with that. I could, I could definitely see that. Their form recently has been pretty bad, but really they should be in the top 10, both of them. But we'll see. We'll see. Lance Stroll especially is uh, far from reliable. <laughs> Sophia, what's, what, what's your poll top three and poll prediction for this weekend? So... Paul, Max, podium will be Max, Oscar, and Lando. Got us for the Papaya, the McLaren. My bold is very similar to Mikel, but I say Lance Stroll's going to finish in top five this time. Instead of being just on the cusp of points, he's going to solidify himself right back in the middle of the points. She's going all in with that bold prediction. I like that. That's spicy. That is very brave. And Sophia, if people want to hear some more predictions, some more spicy predictions from you, they can head over to Formula Talk. Yeah, I hosted along with Tom Downey as well. We cover Formula 2, Formula 3, occasionally IndyCar, Formula E. Pretty much you can find us on the same socials as Grid Talk, but we also have our separate YouTube channel this season for Season 2 of Formula Talk, and you just search Formula Talk on YouTube to find us. It's been a, we'll have a few episodes coming up. Obviously, we've not really covered IndyCar yet, but we will be doing that and some of the mid-season reviews as well while we're in a bit of a break coming up to the summer season as well for F2 and F3. I'm looking forward to it as always. And if you guys want to hear and see more from me, you can head over to my website, footballchronicle.com. That's football spelled Spanish ways, F-U-T-B-O-L. Or you can head over to the Chronicles many video channels as well. We cover football, F1, IndyCar and everything in between really so if you want to hear me my opinions on everything I've already done one on Ocon and why he's essentially been let go of by Alpine and why it's not that big of a surprise and who's likely to go there you can head over to our channels on YouTube Instagram TikTok from Facebook and of course Microsoft Start too but yeah if you want to hear more from Grid Talk we're available on YouTube where most of the episodes are recorded live this is not one of them this is a preview as well as Amazon Fire Spotify Apple Music Verbal Pocket Cast just search for F on Grid Talk and all those all those platforms to find a big pack catalog of shows now I've lost count of how many episodes we've done but it's north of 300 it has to be heading for 400 most likely if you've not already passed it and, and yeah please consider supporting the show on patreon as well if you want to support us financially uh, you can get some better lights night lights mics and recording equipment and what it will be it will be night time when we record the canadian grand prix race review that'll be going out 10 p.m uk time on sunday so please catch us for that one and yeah i want to thank my panelists for joining us as always it's been a great discussion yeah thank you yeah thanks a lot thank you and thank you very much for listening and watching the grid talk podcast presented by bets online and goodbye